Barney here with this week's episode of the Influential Woman of Beverly Hills. Today we have Isabel Hacker, who is a member um, on our Beverly, uh, excuse me, on our Beverly Hills Board of Education. She ran in um, 2015 and was elected onto the board in November of 2015. So I have a couple questions for you today. Thank you, Sophia, for having us. Thank you so much for joining the show. Um, so how long have you lived in the Beverly Hills community? So I've lived here since 2006. Uh, my husband went to school here. Um, he went through Horace Mann, graduated in Beverly Hills High School. That's so nice. So he's been here much longer than I have. Yeah, well it's really great that you've um, joined the Beverly, the Board of Education, the board, um, and you know, just like really immersed yourself into, into our community having not lived here your whole life. Um, so I know that you were on the Horseman's Site Council. I was uh, actually at Hawthorne Site Council. I was at Horseman's PTA and okay. Hawthorne's PTA, okay. as well as the Citizen Service Site Committee. Okay, I see. Um, so after doing that, is that what led you to want to join the board? So it was a series of, of different things that led me to make that decision. Uh, like many in our district, mm -hmm. I really love our schools and really want our schools to uh, just do better. I think we believe that we can do better and it's not to say that we're not in a good place but I think mm -hmm. we can we can definitely um, make better choices and pull together um, to get to, to better the district and so I I thought about a lot of things it was a it was a big decision for me to make and and so it was it was a decision that I finally um, decided to take and and just uh, go and run. Yeah, I mean that sounds like it was definitely an exciting leap to take, and um, it was a, it was yeah. a lot. It, it is exciting, but there's also a big commitment that comes right. along with that. Right, of course. Um, so, can you explain the job of the Board of Education and kind of like what a typical typical day is like, and sure. um, maybe what the challenges are of being on the board? So, really, the board the, the board has five directors, but really we can talk about three because two are, are two, two of the elements are part of a third element, if you will. Really, the role of the board is to, to have a superintendent. So, you know, we only have one employee and that is the superintendent of the district. And having been on the board for a year and having an opportunity to just be involved with um, having Dr. Bragg just come on as our superintendent was a huge uh, opportunity for this board in its entirety to do and I'm very proud of our selection and so really Dr. Breggy in some way encompasses a lot of what the board is expected to do. The board sets vision mm -hmm. uh, for the district. It also um, adopts policy that supports that vision so that that vision can come to fruition and also the, 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 uh, the budget adopts the budget and makes sure that we are operating um, in a very uh, safe, conservative way so that we have longevity with our programs and our school can thrive, our schools can thrive long term. So it's not just looking at the short term issues affecting our budget, but also long term. So those are really the three things, policy, it, facilities is part of that, and also uh, bargaining, you know, the bargaining contract, and you know, th whatever we, we, uh, we adopt as a board, we have to um, have good faith and, 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 and move forward with it. So, so mm -hmm. it's really policy, policy, setting the vision, and then hiring a superintendent to do all these things. The, the, the superintendent manages, they right. leads with a vision uh, that the board directs. I see, that's really interesting. I didn't know that that was your guys' job, but um, what do you guys, um, I mean, you mentioned that there are these three factors that tie into hiring the superintendent, but um, how do you guys decide on who you think is the right fit? For our superintendent? Yeah. Well, it's a collective uh, experience with all five board members. It's not a left up to one, but there has to be a cohesive uh, element to that process because every, every board member wants the same things for the district. We all want the district to move forward. Right. And realizing, and you have, uh, you know, the information that you have as a board member, both in public and behind closed doors, you understand the needs that need to be fulfilled in the district. Mm -hmm. And so, 
it's 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 you know when we selected when you select a, a an employee in this case a superintendent you look at the qualifications of the person the background um, you it's a very thorough process and again we we this was a unique process in that it was the middle of the school year right. but we we're so lucky that we were able to find dr. Breggy I, I have total confidence in dr. Breggy I think anyone who is able to work by his side can quickly see the qualities uh, that he brings to this district that mm -hmm. I think are only going to benefit our students our teachers and our community at large I'm very excited about the selection that we made as a board and I think that when we were in that room together I can really say that there was something very positive and very exciting that was going on and I think we all felt very uh, pleased and delighted with our with our selection um, well I can tell you that the um the Beverly Hills High School highlights actually ran an article profiling Dr. Breggy and I was so impressed with everything that he stood for and I thought that he was a perfect fit and I really loved how they just um, they really wanted to explain to our students that he's here for the long run and that was very comforting um, he, he's so I, I he's so connected to the needs of students and he wants to connect with students and I think that was that really came across everything that I read about him right. from his other experiences being a principal a teacher and a superintendent and I I'm hopeful that he will be able to transmit that and connect here at that level with our students as well I think that's an, a very important part of a superintendent's job and it's critical right so for me I think that's very comforting as a, as a parent and as a board member Right. Well, um, I know that as a board member, there are certain things that you're not able to talk about regarding the Board of Education. Sure. Um, could you explain to me what are, you know, the certain things that you're sure. not able to talk about in public? So there's really only three things that the board can, can you know, has to meet in closed session about, and that is litigation. Um, sometimes they describe that as being anticipated litigation. Um, personnel and negotiations with the union. Um, those are the three things really that we're not allowed to comment or to have a opine in public about. Um, and, and that's just not only true for Beverly Hills, that's true for any um, school, public school district across the state of California and the country. Have you ever come across a situation where you are mm -hmm. in an uncomfortable situation because someone's um, trying to get information that you're not allowed to share out of you? Well, I'm not, it's not uncomfortable, but I, we do have public comment, and mm -hmm. that, is a, that is an opportunity for the public to come and voice their opinion or statements made to the board about anything that is on our agenda, whether it be on closed or, or actually it doesn't even have to be on our agenda, to be honest. But, um, but that happens sometimes, people come and speak. And um, I think sometimes there's a disconnect between um, the expectation that a board president should respond or a member should respond to something that was said and, and that just can't happen that's just not a part of the rules mm -hmm. of, of what obligates us as a board in public so we, we can't respond so I, I sometimes feel really bad when parents or or people come before us and they want a response and, and, and it's not a dialogue so you can't have that right. um, we we sometimes also, I think there's uh, a lot of misinformation that gets out to the community ahead of time, mm -hmm. and so the board can't respond or doesn't respond. Uh, that That's a weakness, I think, that we have as a board that we are trying to fix. I, I'm hopeful that that will lead to more transparency and more communication uh, with the public, because it, it is a weakness uh, in that there's so much rumor and sometimes misinformation that gets distorted, mm -hmm. and so there's it's emotional sometimes for people right understandably so I'm not criticizing that but we but it's it's you're on the receiving end of it and you can't respond or engage so um, sometimes that could be a little frustrating yeah. but I understand that it's it's something that happens all the time and it's to be expected and um, it's not personal it's really just the way things sometimes take a form of its own right um, so what are the protocol for complaints? Okay, so it, you're talking about like if a student has a complaint or yeah. a parent. So that's a great question. Um, 
parents are really, if a parent or a student is having an issue with a particular teacher, let's say, they really should talk to the teacher about mm -hmm. the issue or the concern and try to address, address those issues with the teacher, the parent, the student in the classroom. Um, sometimes that takes more than just one meeting. It can take two meetings, three meetings. And I think most of the time things are resolved. If, if for some reason the parent or the student feels that the issue at hand is not resolved, then I think at that point it's very fair for them to engage the principal. Um, I would suggest having the teacher involved is always better than not. Um, open communication allows for everyone in to understand what the issue is and mm -hmm. to try to respond to that together. Um, if, if, if at that point still the parent the, or the student uh, you know, feels that the issue hasn't been resolved, then you can ask to meet with the superintendent, the principal, um, but that that's extreme. That that usually right. never really happens. Or um, hopefully, I I think most issues are resolved within the you know immediately with the teacher. Right, but if as they should be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But your superintendent is in place so that it doesn't have to come up to the board. The board should never get involved until all of those issues have been all, all of those protocols have been exhausted, and so parents. You know, there is a natural tendency that if they know a board member, they just pick up the phone and call. But mm -hmm. I think it's really important to hold the line to say, hey, you know, you really should be speaking. Have you, have you talked to your, the, the teacher, the principal? And at the very, as a very last resort, the, the, the board should then get involved. The board's right. not there to micromanage the everyday activities of what happens in the school right. or in the classroom. They're there to instill the vision that the vision. they have for the, exactly. the school. And, um, that's really exciting and um, it, it's, a great it's, it's a very critical part of what happens right. in our school district and I you know I, I think that sometimes parents don't understand how how things so simply can be resolved with a with a teacher and some do and and some of them have exhausted and so it's 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 totally fine to call and ask and then I think you need to redirect as you know as a board member right um, so do you have any plans for yourself in the future um, on whether or not you're going to stay on the school board, run for re-election, or do something el else within the city? Or Well, at this point, I, I've just been on the board for one year, and I will tell you that as of February of this year, uh, are you, I'm not sure if you're familiar with SB 415, uh, but it allows for, or mandates, I should say, school boards and city councils to move their elections from an odd year to an even year. And so Beverly Hills Unified School District, our election is set for a odd year, or was set for an odd year. And so members of the board brought it up for discussion and for a vote. And the majority of the vote, uh, a majority of the, of the board decided to give themselves an extra year. Uh, by consequence of that vote, I now, my term, doesn't end in 2019, it ends in 2020. So I get an additional year. So rather than running on a four-year term, I'm now going to serve on a five-year term. So for me, it's all very new. Yeah. Four years is quite a commitment. This last year has been quite a commitment. So I'm focused on resolving the challenges that we have now facing our district mm -hmm. and not so much about getting ahead of myself and m having ideas of something that, that may, um, that, that there's room to think for tomorrow. I mean, there's right now I want to want to focus on today and, and making sure that Dr. Breggy is successful in his tenure here. Um, that to me is very exciting. Well, it's very exciting that you're able to be on the school board for another year just because, you know, um, you've helped the board in finding the superintendent and um, I think that's really great. Um, so what are the benefits of having um, the re-elections on an even year as opposed to an odd year? So the idea behind that is that more people come out and participate, actively participate and engage uh, throughout, you know, engage our elections process. And so that is really the idea. They have found that more, it's no secret that more people come out to vote during a presidential election than not. Mm -hmm. And uh, those elections happen on even years. There's just more going on on calendar on even years and odd years. Usually odd years are just um, local uh, elections and you have less of a group of people coming out to vote. 
Okay. So I will tell you, I believe that for the presidential election, Beverly Hills, there was 14,000 plus people who came out to vote, as opposed to um, the city council, I think there was 5,000. Right. So you could see the disparity in numbers. Right. And, you know, I think that um, Beverly Hills has tried to really make it a point to get the voters out to vote because it is so important because these are the people that run our cities, you know. Correct. The school board members are the people that are um, helping instill what we want to have in our schools. And I think it's important to point out that Beverly Hills is still doing better than other local right. cities. And right. so although we're not hitting those numbers um, as we are on president, uh, uh, the same numbers that we're hitting when, when we have presidential elections, we still have more numbers by far compared to other cities in the state of California. So uh, yeah, w that has something to do with the community that we live in. Right. Well, speaking of Beverly Hills, what is your favorite part of the city? So that's a great question, and I, I thought about that recently. Um, in the words of former mayor and current council member John Mirish, I think what's wonderful about the city is that for many of us, it's it's home, and and it's where we have our families, and from families we have you know in a family is where a lot of the traditions and you know whether you start traditions or continue traditions um, begin, and it's it's an exciting place to it's just I think home is very sacred. It's a great place for anyone and. We're just lucky that Beverly Hills is our home, yeah. and uh, it's a great community. It's a community for all of us who live here. It is a really great community. It is. Well, thank you so much for coming on of my course. show. Thank you for um, having and me. And thank you so much for tuning it's in. It's a really treat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sophia, and good luck to all of you. Thank you so much. Of course.